All right, everybody, welcome back for another deep dive. And this time, we are really getting into the spooky season spirit. We're talking about how to craft those amazing, unforgettable D&D Halloween one-shots. Yeah, one-shots are already a blast, but Halloween just brings a whole other level of fun to the table, doesn't it? 100%. So to help us out today, we've got some really cool sources to pull from. Oh, yeah. Like what? Well, first up, we've got an actual D&D one-shot adventure titled The Crypt of the Forgotten King. This is going to be our case study for the episode. I like it. A real-life example to pick apart. Always helpful. So what makes this script adventure so special for Halloween? Well, it really nails that sense of suspense and dread. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. the kind of adventure where players are on the edge of their seats wondering what's behind every single door, not just throwing monsters at them, but really building that creepy atmosphere. I can see how that would be perfect for Halloween. Get those players really spooked. So how does it actually build that suspense? Got any teasers from the adventure itself? Oh, tons. For starters, the adventure uses really vivid sensory details to set the scene. Like at one point, the players are moving through these narrow passages, and the air is thick with the smell of, and I quote, green brain goo. Later, they find traces of thin black blood splattered on the walls. <laughs> Stuff like that instantly creeps up the creepy factor, you know really brings the dungeon to life. You're totally right. Our sense of smell is so powerful. It can transport us right into the scene, especially when it comes to something like, well, green brain goo. So we've got the spooky setting, but what about the villain? Every good Halloween adventure needs a memorable baddie. What's this crypt of the Forgotten King got? Oh man, the villain in this one is fantastic. And this is where the one shot throws a really cool curveball. So there's this character named Errol that the players might actually end up befriending earlier in the dungeon seems harmless enough, maybe even helpful. But, and this is the good part, through a series of events, he ends up possessed and transformed into this creepy, rambling figure the adventure calls the Thin Man. Talk about a betrayal. Whoa, that's rough. I bet that messes with the players. They think they can trust someone, and then bam, instant villain. Right, and it really makes you question everyone you meet in the dungeon after that. Can't trust anyone. But here's where it gets even better. At the very end of the adventure, the crypt hits the players with this massive moral dilemma. Like, do they destroy the possessed Errol, which would rid the dungeon of his evil? But it might mean facing the wrath of this powerful godmother figure who's kind of looking out for him. Oh, so it's not just about good versus evil, it's about those shades of gray. Those tough choices that make you really think about the consequences, I like that. Exactly. Or, the players could try this risky ritual to try and save Errol from the possession. If they succeed, they might gain a powerful ally. But of course, messing with powerful magic always has the potential to backfire, right? Yeah. And in this case, failure could mean incurring the wrath of the crypt's original owner, the Forgotten King himself. Talk about a no-win situation. Now that's how you keep players on their toes. Tough choices, lasting consequences, it's all there. And for a DM, having those different paths and rewards already detailed out is super helpful. Shows you how to build in those meaningful consequences that last beyond the one shot. See, and that right there, that's what makes for such a good Halloween game, in my opinion. Those tough choices that go beyond just good guys versus bad guys. It's those morally gray areas that really get under your skin. Totally. And that kind of leads us into our next source, this great article titled Spine Chilling Nights, Mastering the Art of D&D Halloween One-Shots. And you know, one of the things that really emphasizes sensory details, they're key for setting the mood. Oh, for sure. We talked about the green brain goo from the crypt, but this article takes it way further. It's about engaging all the senses. Mm -hmm. Like instead of just saying it's a foggy night, Describe that clammy mist clinging to your players' faces, you know? Oh. Make them feel the chill as they walk through a graveyard. Yeah. Or describe the musty scent of decaying wood as they step into a haunted house. Make them practically smell the dust and cobwebs. Get those sensory details right and bam, instant atmosphere. Exactly. And it doesn't stop with descriptions, right? I mean, think about the actual experience. What does your Halloween one-shot sound like? This article, it suggests like dimming the lights, breaking out some candles, battery operated, of course, got to be safe. But that sets the mood right away. Oh, yeah. And some spooky music playing in the background. A little creepy ambience goes a long way. Seriously. <laughs> oh, and sound effects. Those are a game changer. Like when the players are exploring that creepy house and they open a door, boom, a center clang of a ghostly piano just to mess with them. Oh, I love that. 
There are even soundboards online where you can find all kinds of effects timed perfectly for those moments. You know, rattling chains, disembodied whispers, that kind of thing. See, that's what I'm talking about. It's those little touches that make all the difference. And you know what else is fun? Getting the players in on the act. Encourage them to dress up in costume for the session, really get into character. Oh, yeah. And have some Halloween-themed snacks. That's always a hit. Seriously. <laughs> because nothing says immersive D&D, like, you know, munching on some zombie fingers while your character's fighting off a horde of ghouls, right? Yeah. You said it. It's all about creating that experience. And speaking of encounters, we got to talk about pacing. The article stresses this a lot. You want to keep players on their toes, and that means mixing things up. You can't have all scares all the time, right? Like, like roller coaster. You need those slow climbs, those moments of anticipation, and then bam, the drop, the scare, the big reveal. Exactly. You need that variety to keep the energy up. And you know what? The Crypt of the Forgotten King, it actually does a really good job with this. Remember that initial attack with the giant rats? Pure adrenaline, right? <laughs> Gets the player's hearts pumping right away. But then it shifts gears. They start encountering these locked doors, each one potentially hiding something awful, and that creates a different kind of tension. Oh, totally. It's like that suspense is building with every step and the players have no idea what's going to be behind each door. Do they risk opening it? What if something horrible bursts out? It's brilliant. And just when they think they've got a handle on things, bam! Errol's betrayal, oh. total curveball. That's how you keep players engaged. And that's what this article is all about in incorporating a real variety of encounters. Mm. Yeah, you need combat, but mix it up with social interaction, exploration, puzzles. It's about keeping things fresh and unpredictable. Makes sense keeps everyone engaged. Oh, and speaking of keeping things interesting, the article also talks about environmental storytelling. And mm. I got to say, I love this idea. It's basically using the environment itself to freak your players out, right? Yeah. It's about dropping those subtle hints, building dread in those quiet moments. For example, let's say your players are exploring a spooky old mansion. Instead of some ghost popping out yelling, boo, use the environment to make them feel like something's off. Maybe there's a cold spot that seems to follow them from room to room. Oh, creepy. I like it. Or they find a child's toy just sitting on the floor, but when they look away and back, it's moved slightly. Or an old diary with a chilling entry, you know, hinting at what happened in this house. You're messing with their heads. I love it. You're not just telling them it's scary. You're letting them piece it together themselves, letting their imaginations run wild. Precisely. It's way more effective than just saying, this place is haunted, let them feel it. And when you do get to those more direct encounters, whether it's combat or social interaction, think about how you can really make them scream Halloween. So instead of just a random encounter with some zombies, those zombies are bursting out from under tombstones in a graveyard, moonlight shining down on their rotting flesh. Now you're talking. And remember those sensory details we talked about? Don't just tell your players they're fighting zombies. Make them smell the decay, you know, <laughs> the stench of rotting flesh. And speaking of making those encounters memorable, you know one thing that always gets me? Those creepy non-combat encounters? The kind where you're not sure if you're in danger or not, but something feels off. Oh, absolutely. Those are the ones that really stick with you. Sometimes the creepiest moments in a game aren't about fighting for your life. They're about talking to the wrong person, you know? 100%. Like, imagine your players cautiously approaching this shadowy figure in a moonlit alleyway. Mm -hmm. They're hoping to get some information, maybe find out what's going on in this creepy town they've stumbled into. But as they get closer, they realize it's not a person at all, but a grotesque mimic its teeth bared in a horrifying grin. Oh, that's just wrong. Right. That's an image that's going to stick with them for a while. No kidding. Or what if they stumble upon the seemingly harmless soul woman in the woods? You know, classic horror trope. She offers them tea and gives these cryptic warnings about the dangers lurking in the forest. But is she just a weird but ultimately helpful NPC? Or is she something far more sinister? Yeah. It's those encounters that get under your skin, you know? Oh, for sure. Because now the players are second-guessing every interaction. Exactly. They never know who to trust. And, you know, for DMs who really like to get creative with their encounters, the article also mentions these things called skill challenges, which can be a really fun way to make those non-combat moments more interactive. Skill challenges. Okay, <laughs> remind me what those are again. 
So basically, a skill challenge is a situation where your players need to succeed on a series of skill checks to accomplish some goal. Let's say they're trying to perform this ritual to banish a malevolent spirit. Instead of just having one big religion check, you could break it down into smaller challenges. Like, they need to make a religion check to recall the proper incantation, then an arcana check to channel the magical energy, maybe even a performance check to maintain the rhythm of the chant. Oh, that's so much more interesting than just saying, okay, you need to roll a 15 on this check. Right. It makes those scenes so much more engaging, and it gives everyone a chance to shine, even if they're not the best at, you know, fighting off ghouls. And speaking of things that go bump in the night, we can't forget about the NPCs. I mean, they're the heart and soul of any good D&D session, right? Especially a spooky one. What kind of memorable characters can we use to bring these creepy settings to life? Well, the article has some really cool examples. You've got your mysterious caretakers, the ones with secrets hidden behind their eyes, always watching the player's every move. Or the tragic ghosts, the ones seeking revenge or closure. Oh, and don't forget about those creepy children who are never quite what they seem. Those are always good for a scare. And, you know, what's cool is you could easily slot these character archetypes right into the Crypt of the Forgotten King one shot mm -hmm. to give it even more flavor. Oh, totally. Imagine that disembodied voice guiding the players through the crypt. Mm -hmm. What if it's not just some random spirit, but the vengeful ghost of the Forgotten King's brother? Maybe he was betrayed and left to rot in the crypt, and now he's back for revenge. Oh, I like it as a whole other layer to the story. So we've got these cool character concepts, but how do we as DMs actually make them memorable? How do we make these NPCs really come to life at the table? It's all about the details. Give them little quirks, you know, strange habits, maybe a catchphrase that your players will be quoting weeks later. And most importantly, give them secrets. Every good NPC has a secret or two, something that makes them more than meets the eye. It's true. Yeah. Even though it's a one-shot, you still want those NPCs to feel like real, well-rounded characters or creatures, as the mm. case may be. Okay, we've talked creepy settings, spooky NPCs. I think it's time to talk monsters. Because it wouldn't be a Halloween one-shot without some truly terrifying creatures, right? Of course not. But the key is to use those classic monsters in unexpected ways. Yeah, you've got your vampires, werewolves, zombies, the usual suspects, but let's put a twist on them. Give me an example. How would you spice up a vampire encounter? Okay, so instead of your typical suave, sophisticated Dracula type, what if your players encounter a vampire child? You know, cursed to remain eternally young, forever craving a life they can never have. Or how about a werewolf who absolutely despises their curse? They're desperately clinging to their humanity, but every full moon, they're forced to transform. It's those unexpected twists that really make an encounter memorable. Right, absolutely. And, you know, don't be afraid to think outside the box either. The, the article talks about reskinning, which is basically taking an existing monster from the D&D universe and giving it a spooky Halloween makeover. Oh, I love that. It's like giving your players a fun little curveball. They think they know what they're dealing with, and then bam, you hit them with a monster they've never even imagined. Exactly. So that monstrous spider guarding the crypt's entrance, maybe it's actually a giant mutated tick with glowing eyes and a taste for adventurer blood. Ew, that's disgusting. But I love it. See, that's the beauty of D&D, &D, right? There are literally no limits to the spooky situations you can create. But all those encounters, those creepy NPCs, the terrifying monsters, they're all building towards something, right? That epic climax, the grand finale of your Halloween one-shot. Couldn't have said it better myself. And one thing that this article emphasizes is that the climax of your one-shot needs to be unforgettable. You've got to raise the stakes, make the consequences of failure real, and maybe even a little bit terrifying. And it should tie back to the choices the players have made throughout the adventure, right? 100%. And remember that moral dilemma in the Crypt of the Forgotten King, where they have to decide whether to destroy the Thin Man or try to save him? What if that final battle takes place in the heart of the crypt, surrounded by those glowing, pulsating orbs we talked about earlier? The fate of Errol hangs in the balance, and the choices the players made, those choices come back to either help them or haunt them in this final showdown. Now, that's how you craft a climax that'll have your players talking long after the game's over. Now you're getting it. And don't forget, if you're looking for even more inspiration, our third source for today is that incredible D100 Random Encounter Tables resource. Seriously, this thing is a goldmine of ideas, with tables specifically designed for swamps, forests, cities, the wilderness, even a gothic fantasy-cursed castle. It's amazing. Use those tables to brainstorm your own campaign ideas. 
or to add those little unexpected twists to your existing ones. So as we wrap up this Halloween-themed deep dive, remember, it's all about striking that balance between spine-chilling horror and engaging gameplay. Use those sensory details, craft those heart-pounding encounters, and don't be afraid to get creative with your NPCs and monsters. Oh, and one last thing to chew on. What if, in the trip to the Forgotten King, your players decide to join the Thin Man? Could they become this party of spooky anti-heroes, their adventures a source of both terror and amusement? Until next time, keep those dice rolling, those imaginations fired up, and happy haunting.